Jesus, and we pray that you would increase our understanding of your word so that you might more effectively speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, as we come to it. We ask that your Spirit just shout at us from the pages, Lord, and lead us to the life that you want, Lord Jesus. Uh, we hold this time up, Lord. Uh, bring accuracy and focus to my words today, Lord Jesus, and bless the groups, Lord, that will take this material and be teaching it even more broadly through our church. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, welcome. We are in the second class uh, today, of course, from the sermon this morning. You know we're in Old Testament historical narrative, and uh, it's a, a special genre of scripture. We're in the middle of a 10-week series, and we're going to be covering each genre, literary genre in the Bible, all the way up until uh, till we get apocalyptic literature, which is the book of Revelation, on the March 26th. That's going to be an exciting one. To we'll wrap our series up, and hopefully you bring your questions, and we uh, have an interesting discussion on that day in particular. But I'm excited about all the things that are in here. And, and the goal is, like what I said last time, the goal is maybe this is the year where you read the Bible, and you pull out some of these focal points that we're talking about in here. And you now don't have to skip the parts that are confusing, or you can really process them and say, okay, Spirit of God, now I know what you want me to look for in the text, speak to my life. And that that's the goal of all of this. So maybe this is a year where you just get that last bit of understanding that you need so that you can confidently move through the text. Um, on some of the talks, I'm going to just open uh, suggesting a couple tools that may help you. This came up last time. I think Steve brought it up last time. Steve, were you here somewhere? Where are you? Are you? Not here. No. He brought this up last time. And of course, I didn't want to cover too much about tools on the very first talk. But part of the, part of the difficulty in understanding the text is that there's, there are literary issues in the text. The language that's used, terms that are being used that can be sometimes confusing to us today. And there are also historical issues that underlie the, the, the scenes, the action, uh, the peoples that we're dealing with, especially in the Old Testament. It's rather far from us, many thousands of years ago. And there are differences between these people and us. And it can complicate our ability to understand them. Sometimes we read the text and we think, what is up with these people? They're, they're so weird compared to us. And if they were able to look across time at us, they would say, what's up with the Christians in the United States in the 2020s? They are so weird. What's, they don't love family like we love family. What's going on? And they would look at our culture and it would baffle them. All right? And the same way, though, theirs baffles us a little bit. And when we understand more about that, we're better equipped to understand what the point is in the, the text that God wants us to get from that. There are a couple really great tools to help you with those things. One thing I highly recommend, uh, especially in a pinch, is to get a good study Bible. And a study Bible is like has little mini commentary bits woven through it usually in the form of footnotes and sometimes with short articles that precede books to give you the background of the book and then also sometimes little they'll have little uh, you know focus topics inside that help you to understand the culture and the language and the people of that uh, part of the world at the time that the Bible is being written for them. I, so I highly recommend that. That's a great starting point. The, the goal of a good study Bible should be to answer just the kind of questions that we would have. And hopefully they've organized it that way. The NID Study Bible, highly recommended. I just got one for my son, my 17-year-old son, for Christmas. He's asking me for a Bible. I got him the NID Study Bible. But to get beyond that in depth, and, and especially for some of you that are group leaders and or want to be teachers in the church, maybe God is preparing you for teaching ministry, you see that happening more, is to think about investing in some commentaries. Commentaries are books that are written in depth about all the different books in the Bible, unpacking them, and hopefully you're getting some some very helpful and different things in different kinds of commentaries. I want to talk about the three kinds of commentaries that are out there. You can't just order anything and expect to get the same result from a commentary. The first kind of commentary is a pastoral commentary. 
It's what a pastor might write. Maybe he's prepared and delivered a, a series of sermons like Chuck Swindoll, for example. He has tons of practical books on all the books of the Bible. He writes those kind of books. They're not in-depth studies about the history or the language. They're very much oriented toward devotional understanding of the text. He'll give you some background, which he's pulling from these other kinds of commentaries himself. But he's more focused on ministering to you through his book. So that's the first kind. Those are obviously very readable. They're more like devotionals on a book. Second kind of commentary is called an exegetical commentary. You do not want to buy these unless you go to seminary and know the original languages of Scripture. They're not going to be very useful to you. A lot of exegetical commentaries are for digging into the actual construction of the Hebrew or Greek sentences that you find in Scripture. They're unpacking words. They're cross-referencing them. They might cross-reference them to extra-biblical literature of ancient times. Stuff you don't care about at all. And you will, if, as you're working through it, you're going to find very little practical devotional in an exegetical commentary. I use those when I'm preparing. You, don't, that, you can skip that step because the last kind of commentary has that information already pre-digested for you. And that's an expositional commentary. I've got a couple for you. An expositional commentary is a commentary that's built to equip a pastor who doesn't necessarily have a lot of depth in biblical languages but has a little bit of training to try to prepare them to, to speak on the text. To give them the, the, the underlying historical uh, literary issues that the pastor needs to be aware of. And there are tons of great commentaries that are more expositional. If you're wondering about it, you can look at ratings on an Amazon or something like that to try to figure it out. This is a multi-volume series called the Expositor's Bible Commentary. It's very in-depth. It's not over a regular person's head, but it's, it's very deep. And there are also going to be theological and devotional points that these authors will make. They're, they're wonderful. These are the Expositor's Bible Commentary are written by evangelical Christian scholars, and they will go beyond just analyzing the text and giving you background and actually talk about what God is saying in that passage. So you'll, you'll get kind of the first movement to biblical principles from a commentary like this. This is, I think, 13 volumes to cover the entire Bible. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of an investment. Um, if, if you more want to work on a book-by-book -book kind of basis, uh, this is a terrific commentary series, NID Application Commentary, and it even more leans into practical application while still giving you all the background information you need. They, they have these for every book of the Bible, this is one that I looked at when I was teaching from Nehemiah, and you'll, you'll find these, and some of them are, are actually considered like the top commentary out there, I happen to be in this series. There's a few of them that are really, really outstanding. So I recommend this. So if you're really looking at this and you're a teacher, and you want to get in depth, you know, and you want to make a little financial investment, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can find these on Amazon. These are two very highly recommended resources that, that you don't need to go to seminary to, to pull good information from them, okay? But other than that, it's very difficult to know. You know, a study Bible is a good starting place, for sure. Okay, so let's talk about historical narrative and what it's all about. Uh, I got the scene up here again, David, getting it done. Question. Yes. Yes. Uh, is it okay I do my research from Google? And I, I like desiring... God. I, I always look at the source. Absolutely. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's very particular, like a particular uh, verse in the Bible, mm -hmm. specific one by the Bible. There, there are some good online resources to connect you up with uh, beyond, I mean, you if you know the source and trust yeah. the source, that's the, the part you have to be cautious because there are people out there that have rather you know interesting and extreme views, especially when we get to Revelation. So you want to be careful about that. Yeah. Newbible.com has most of the commentaries by Chuck Swindoll and numerous. There, and there are some aggregate. There are some websites. I don't have one for you, but there are, that aggregate some like public domain older commentary series, so you can get that. They also make this one 
in a condensed version. I think it's a two volume, one volume Old Testament, one volume New Testament. So if you wanted to go with something abridged, uh, 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 they do make those kind of resources also. I'll, I'll be bringing in some other things to show you in coming weeks that I recommend that are really good tools also. But these are just to get you going, get you in that frame of mind. Yeah, you can't know all of it when you come to a text. There, even if you've been in Scripture for a long time, there are men, uh, women who have dedicated their lives to studying specific books that love the Lord and are pouring out their ministry, their scholarship into a book like that. So that you give them an opportunity to teach you when you pick up their book, right? And, and it's super helpful. And, and, and when we come to the Old Testament, particularly so, I, I happen to think, because we're just so far from these people in our, in our social basis. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, so I say the narrative portions of the Old Testament cover roughly 40%. And they viewed as a whole, they reveal the unfolding of God's plan for his people across history. There really is a big story. Frank kind of hit that today in the sermon. There really is a big story behind the Bible. <laughs> And narratives fit into that. And some of them go, in, go into interesting places and introduce us to interesting characters. But in the end, there's a central idea. And there's a tapestry, and these people are all woven into it. And, and so that's, and it's, it's written, and we'll get to this at the very end, it's written so that you would see yourself as part of that story. You, that, that's why it's there. Yeah, these are regular, everyday people. Some of them fail miserably. But God used all of them in one way or another. Some for bad and mostly, though, for good. You are part of that story. That's why it's there in the Bible for you to know that and see that. Um, evil is part of this story, but it's permitted. It has a purpose. Uh, it, it's a fascinating uh, part of the tapestry woven in. It's, things are not out of control. God is in control, and he's even permitted evil for his ultimate victory and purposes. Uh, and so we learn about God. God's the central character in the Old Testament. This is the thing that you always want to recommend, and it's, it's, it's tempting at times to focus on people and lift them up as like hero figures, like superheroes or something. And some of them are. I mean, like you have a Daniel. I mean, the man, everything he did glorified God. And there's this, you don't have to ever really worry about a guy like Daniel. But then you have people like David, King David. We're going to look at him. And he messes up, I think, more than he gets it right. And yet he's a man after God's own heart. So, so you have to be careful. We're going to be taking, we'll, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But our prayer is for the Spirit to speak. Uh, from the text, from the narrative, to lead us into becoming the people that he wants us to be. That's what it's all about. Um, to have that kind of life where we're part of God's story. It's, and what we learn from narrative is it's not about doing some big, huge thing sometimes. Sometimes people just have that one critical moment in God's plan, like an Esther, right? Um, or even a roof, and you think they didn't, they weren't some great huge conqueror, biblical conqueror, but they were people that God used, and He had them for such a moment as that, and that's all of us. Whatever God's got, He's got you as part of His story. You have no idea what that will be, but a moment will come, and you will have a chance to trust Him and become part of that story, and that's what narrative it prepares us for that idea. We wait for it. We say, Lord, like in Abraham, I'm waiting for that moment, so I can be part of your story. Okay, so the second part here, narrative has three levels. Frank actually touched on those in the lecture, but I want to focus on these, it's very important. The first idea is that when we come to the text, we have to see it uh, in, on, on, in cascading levels. I actually, let me, let me go to the, first is God's plan of salvation across history, then his plan for the nation of Israel and its historic setting, and under the covenant, uh, the, the old covenant, which we talked about last time, very important to see that as the framework. And then specifically the narrative within that context. Um, so, wait, did I? Oh, oh, where'd it go? Okay, I had a slide. I wonder, hmm. But I have been saved in a different place. Maybe so. Okay, sorry. All right, so what I had, let me tell you what I had. It was so awesome. I had this, I have a box where I show the narrative. Maybe, okay, maybe, I'm, maybe it's a little later on. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we come to it. But I, there's a point where I'm showing the narrative of 1 Samuel 17. So I'm showing the narrative with David. 
And then I'm showing it in this bigger box that it sits inside of, which is God's plan for Israel under the Old Covenant. This idea. And, and I, I take a key verse from David. We're going to talk about first point of dialogue. And then I show how there's a broader point that that point relates to the bigger point of God's work with Israel. And then there's an even bigger framework, which is God's work across salvation history, which reaches out and includes us. And you, can, you don't want to look at that narrative in a way which t pulls it out of that larger framework. It really is a big story. It'd be kind of like reading a book and taking a scene from a book and then pulling it, ripping it completely out of that book and ignoring what the rest of the book is about. Well, that, what that might leave you with, you might misinterpret the scene. You might read that scene and think, oh, it's, the book's about this or that. You know, it's about, oh, the bad guy wins. But no, no, the good guy wins in the end. You, you can't take that narrative out of place. And it's the same with Scripture. This is an important thing that we need to see. Um, the top level is about God's plan. And when you come to the Old Testament, you need to look for him always as the most important figure, even when he's not showing up in person. Sometimes he shows up. But sometimes he doesn't, he's behind the scenes. But his, his character and his purposes cross that gap and are powerful for us today. Uh, and you need to look at it that way. We, we, I, I did, uh, Graham and I did a, a series on Nehemiah over the summer. If you think back to that series, notice that I didn't spend a lot of time focusing on Nehemiah in that series. The name of the series was The God That Rebuilds, Restores, and Renews. God is the hero behind the restoration of Jerusalem and the restoration of the Jewish people and bringing them back into fellowship and worship with him. Nehemiah was just a guy. He was an awesome guy in that story. But we, don't, we didn't focus on it as, let's learn how to be uh, like Nehemiah or be good leaders or anything like that. We, I, the story is about the heart of God, and it's no different today. So if you focus on God, you're going to get principles that are going to work for us today because he's not changed at all. So st stick with God, number one. Where is, what are God's purposes? How does this tie together with his big plan? If you look at it like that in the heart of God, you're, you're going to stay out of a lot of trouble. Our, our tendency is just to take narratives out of context and jump them directly into our lives. And I'll talk a little bit about what that might look like and might misfire. Today, Frank says, you know, the story of David and Goliath is the story of how being a little guy, you know, God helps the little guy win. It's the story of the underdog. That's not what the story's about. And if you take, if you make that jump, you're going to maybe miss the bigger point, which is really about God in that passage. Okay, second one, God's plan for the nation of Israel in its historic setting. This is going to solve a lot of problems where you're reading the Old Testament narrative and you're like, how is God commanding these people to go to battle, to kill people, to do all these things? If you look at it and try to jump directly from that to our time, you're like, wait, the Old and New Testaments can't even fit together. And you'll hear this argument out there. That's because of a bad interpretational move. You have to understand God's purposes for these people in that historic setting which is all around the survival, preservation, and holiness of that people. And the way he accomplished that is very different than what he's doing through the church. So when, if you jump ahead, if you try to jump from a narrative directly to our time, you say, this isn't speaking to me. But if you take a step back and go, wait a minute, what's God's intention for this people? It's very different from his intention for God's people today then I can get to the principle behind it that's going to be useful to me. Wow, God really loved these people and used them in powerful ways against his enemies. It's, it's a very different idea than the way God works today with the church, but it's important. It's, it's also important to remember and to look at this fact. These, these people are not, like I said earlier, they're not like us. They're not Western individualists. They're not consumer people. They're not ordering stuff on Amazon all the time. They don't have to drive on the freeway to go to work like we do. They have different, they don't have the stress as we do. They've got different stress than we do. That if you think about it, and you need to like make some space for that on these people. I mean, they're, they're, how are we going to get food today? How are we going to get killed by these people uh, that are you know, living nearby us? And it's different. We struggle with what is our purpose? We think we're in our heads all the time. We think a lot about things and don't do much. These people did a lot and didn't think very much. And so, right? And so God is always telling them, think, remember, focus your mind a certain way. And he's telling us, 
Stop worrying and start doing some things. See, it's a, it's a different thing. If, you, if we don't recognize that, we're going to miss uh, some of the differences between these people. So we have to allow for that as we're stepping back. Otherwise, we're not going to identify, not get to the real point behind some of these narratives. And then the last is God's plan for the specific people. Uh, that's kind of the bottom level on this whole process. Uh, and it's important to know because that, that you have to look at it in the sense because sometimes the moral commentary is missing from passages. So if you, if you look at the passage and you're like, oh, and we'll look at it one here in a second, and you think, where's, God, where's God's opinion about this? I'm not reading it. This per Solomon took many wives, okay? It, was God good with that? You know, and, to, and, and, and why is he permitting that? You're gonna, you can start to get confused if you look at it at that level. So you can't automatically assume that because you're reading something and somebody seems like a hero or is at times a hero, that it's meant to directly apply to us in our time. It, it doesn't. It, 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 we have to be careful about it. So we're going to look for some clues, and I'm going to tell you the clues that you need to look for to really unpack it and get to the point. But the point is to connect the bottom level, the individual narrative, all the way up the chain as like a scene in a book. And what you really know is you're going to understand that scene based on the point of the book as a whole. Um, so the specifics in the narrative, we don't want to jump from the specifics to our time. Otherwise, we might start doing uh, silly things like, okay, David had five stones. What are my five stones like? <laughs> you know? But that, and, you know, that's kind of a cool thought, application. If that makes you remember the text, Here's the five things God wants me to use in my battle against Satan. That's fine. Just understand, that's not what the text is teaching you. That's just an idea in your own devotional life that might help you apply it, but you know that's not what the text is showing you. The fact that there were five stones and not six stones probably doesn't matter. I don't think he even used all five stones. I don't think he needed to, right? He needed one stone. So why was it? Again, so we don't get Samson's hair. What is Samson's hair? You know, Lord, you know, what is... What is that on me? Is that my car? Is that my hair? What is it? And you know, no, it's not about that. Okay, that's not the point of the narrative. So the, the hair represents a, a commitment to God. It doesn't, it's not directly applicable to something in your life. So we want to make sure we don't do that. Uh, this is history. Sometimes things are just things in the text because they happen and for no particular reason. So we don't want to turn them into you know allegories and, and stories that we pull across directly and try to make of our lives. But again, the Lord could still speak to you from those things and give you some nice you know, ways to think applicationally in your life if that is helpful to you. you know, if you want to keep five stones with scripture verses on your desk or something like that, I think that's really cool. But it's not what the text is teaching us, right? Okay. Um, here's an example of going wrong. A great example, this one comes up a lot when you're talking about Old Testament narrative, is Gideon's fleece in Judges chapter 6. Okay, so this is the thing. We look at this and Gideon's this guy who just doesn't want, he's afraid, he's insecure, he lacks faith. And so he keeps testing God's commands. Okay, Lord, now I put this animal fur out, make it wet all around in the morning, but not on the, not on the fur. Now, okay, Lord, okay, that could have been a coincidence. Now make it wet on the fur in the morning and make the ground all dry. And he keeps doing this sort of thing. And you know, and you know God's up there thinking, why am I doing this? Just trust me, right? But there's no context in it. So people, there's nothing there that says, and God was really unhappy with Gideon, but he did it anyway. It doesn't say that. So when, when you read it, the temptation is to look at that and think, hmm, maybe, maybe I should put something out and yeah. see if God does it, right? Because wouldn't you like that kind of instruction as you're struggling with decisions in your yeah. life? Maybe I should, you know, Lord, I'm just going to leave that milk out. And in the morning, <laughs> if I drink it and it's sour, then I'm going to know that I shouldn't date this person or something like that. Right? People do this kind of thing. This isn't those, aren't those the issues you want? Wouldn't it be cool if it worked that way? Okay, well, number one, old covenant, new covenant. Now we have the Holy Spirit. Number two, there's nothing in the text that is uh, normalizing that principle. If anything, it's the opposite. The big story of Gideon is God uses even insecure and fearful people and is incredibly patient with them. Okay? It doesn't mean you're supposed to throw a fleece out. That's a great example. 
And, uh, there were a lot of things, like a lot of commentary, a lot of commentary in Abraham's journey. That man made some really weird decisions in his own life. And uh, God is constantly continuing to walk with him and lead him through it. But we can't infer anything about that. Um, in the same way that you might want to uh, kind of flip it around, we'll, we'll look at an actual interpretational uh, passage here in a second. Flip it around. Now imagine if Gideon could look into the future and see your life. And you have a testimony of, there I was on Google, and I was praying about something, and I started doing a search, and, God, and some images came up of some doves, and God spoke to me through that experience and told me that he would give me peace and that I didn't need to worry. And imagine you had that experience, and that's part of your testimony, because God can use anything to speak to you, okay? And then imagine Gideon's watching that from the past, and imagine he says, I need to start searching for some birds, right? <laughs> you would tell him, no, 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 that's not the point of what I happened to me. Like, and so this, but we do it to him. We do it to the Old Testament. They, you, you wouldn't expect them to do it to us. You driving around in your car isn't directly applicable to them, and it's the same with the fleece. So this is so this is why we want to we want to look at things in a context and do our very best to get to the principle that makes sense of it under the old covenant. And then the third point I have up here: the Old Testament narrative is intended for us. Uh, Romans 15, 4, but secondarily, therefore, we take steps to interpret it that include starting from the original context and cautiously moving to our culture and our individual lives. And I'm going to give you some strategies for that, okay? Uh, let's see. Okay. Here are the clues. When you're, when you're reading narrative, there are things you're looking for. And I picked four that I think are really important things to look for, and I'm going to show you them in a couple narratives, including the David and Goliath narrative is one of them I'm going to show you for. And I'm going to show you the David and Bathsheba narrative. Okay, things to look for. First, parts of the story that directly relate to commands in the law. Sometimes commentary is missing because God's already spoken on it. And the assumption is that as that the people that the, the text, the inspiration of the text was for the original people that this was given to, the people of Israel, they knew the law. So they didn't have to remind them in, in the story. And by the way, when David was having sex with Uriah's wife, he was breaking the law. Okay, they didn't have to say that. So, but we need to know that as we're reading it. We need to know when that's the case. This is really. Hmm. Okay, I okay. Hold on. I want to hold on one second here. I'm. This is not even the right. This is not the one I was thinking we were gonna have. Hold on. Let's see if I can figure out what went wrong. Hmm. What did I do? I worked on this all day and. Uh, on it on my other computer and it didn't sync apparently. So let me see if I can get it. I spent all day putting extra slides in to illustrate all of these principles I'm about to show you. Okay. Hmm. Here it is. It's coming right now. It says it's downloading it. Okay. <laughs> One moment. It's so big. It must be because it's so big. And uh, and the network here isn't that fast. So, okay. One sec. I'm going to get this. Syncing. Understand what it is. Seven minutes, it says. <laughs> wow. No. No. We're going we're gonna to just keep going, and then I'm going to go backward once it's here. Okay. Hold on. Sorry about that, everybody. That's, that won't happen again. Make sure we're synced. 
Um, okay, so the, the first idea is parts of the story that directly relate to commands in the law. So this, is, this seems really obvious to us, but you need to know the background of the Old Covenant in order to make sense of stories. It, part of uh, the expectation in the original author, the narrator of the text, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is that his people would know what God expects of them as expressed in the law. So we need to be aware of that. So just because you don't see something in the text giving you commentary on this is wrong or something like that doesn't mean that it's not there, it's implicit. So knowing the law and understanding the law is, is an implicit part of the text. Um, second is statements by the narrator that reflect God's point of view. I was going to show you, a, a okay, so we'll get it in a second. Uh, there's, there's some passages where you're reading a story, and it'll be talking about what happens, and the, and the example I was going to use is from Genesis, it's in the, the life of uh, Joseph, and there's a passage where it talks about uh, Joseph prospering in the house of Potiphar, but then there's a statement in there that says, and it's because of the Lord that he prospered. That statement, see, makes all the difference in understanding it. The narrator is letting you know this isn't coincidental. It's not that he was a good guy. It was because God was working through him. When the narrator gives you something like that, right away, that's the thing you should circle to understand. Because all of a sudden, he's, he's crossing over from God's point of view down to like a human view, just watching the action in the text. He's giving you that bit of extra information. You always want to look for times where it's God's perspective is revealed by the narrator in the story, like that this is because of the power of God or something along those lines. You want to look for those telltale signs that, or you can also look for specifically if God happens to speak in the passage. And we'll look at a passage where he does that uh, here in a second. God, God sometimes will actually appear, speak, speak through a prophet, something along those lines. And when you have that, now you understand. This is like a point where you can cross from these uh, 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 things that happen in this ancient context, and all of a sudden you're being lifted up and looking at the what's happening from God's point of view. Very important. Third thing is the first point of dialogue in a scene. Uh, first point of dialogue, this is, a, this is a term, a guy who teaches interpretation, his name's Gordon Fee. Uh, this is his, uh, what he calls it. It might be a little confusing. In, in a dialogue, there is, it, where there's two people in, in conversation, there's a point where all of a sudden the dialogue basically wraps up the important point of the interaction. And, that's what happened in the, in the David and Goliath. There's a point there where David's talking to Goliath and gives him the whole point of what's about to happen to him, which is that he's not lined himself up against a shepherd boy or even against Israel, but against the living God. That's the thing you, that jumps out at you, and it's usually revealed in this, maybe call it the critical point of dialogue, and it's often near the end of the story, where all of a sudden you've got, this is what it's all about, the narrator, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is making sure we read that thing that ties together everything before, which could be confusing to us, but in that sentence it is revealed. That is the point of David and Goliath, that these people lined themselves up against God, and God and his purposes will overcome in that narrative, in the people of Israel, which are still preserved to this day, and across salvation history, you think things are out of control, you think things you should be afraid, it looks like evil is there, taunting, and it is posing a threat. The message of that text is, if you are lined up with the living God, you are going to have victory. That's, that's what we learn. It doesn't matter if you're a shepherd boy, or the biggest guy in the room. Yeah, nobody's big enough to fight off an entire army opposing them unless you have God with you. That's the story. That's the key to that story. So it's revealed in that dialogue. Ruth chapter 3, Boaz and Ruth, she comes into the threshing room floor. They have a short conversation, and, she, and he says something to her that reveals kind of the whole point of the book in that short conversation. You're looking for that. That's the thing you're circling. 
It's an inspiration of the Spirit. It's not just the recording. Boaz's words are Scripture. That, and you want to kind of circle that. David's words that are recorded in Scripture, that's the Holy Spirit. And you want to look at that. That's <coughs> revealing to you the, how we get from that narrative to our lives. And then uh, last is repetition. Repetition is when a, a statement is made over and over in the text, or repeated at least a couple of times in the text. This is part of the cueing, it's part of this culture, and it's also part of the way the Holy Spirit works, so that we don't miss it. Sometimes things are repeated multiple times. In that narrative with David and Goliath, there are three different times in that narrative where the words, you have defied the, defied the living God, or defied the armies of the living God appear. Three different times. That's to clue you up. That's why these people are about to be destroyed. Three different times. When you see that, you understand this is the point. What, yeah, it's the point of our victory, and it's the point of their defeat, is they have stood up against God, and that's why. And so that, when you see something repeated multiple times, it, it, it will jump out at you. And okay, so let me see if I can get beyond this now and get to the updated one. Lord, let it be here. Sinking. One minute. Okay. One minute. Let it, let it be so. Let it be so. So what I went through is I showed you specific examples of these four points. As you're reading, you know, if you're doing some highlighting, if you're keeping notes, these are things you want to underline, and, to, and okay, now I'm seeing it. Now I'm seeing the critical part of this narrative. Okay, one thing that's still not updated. Oh no, don't pause the sink. Let the sink go. <laughs> before you leave your home network. So let's jump ahead. Maybe we'll go backward. Okay. So here's how we move. And, and it, we're, all, the, all our movement from the text to application is going to work in a similar way as we look at But we want to start with, at the bottom level, the narrative. So the specific story that we're working with. You want to take that, and, and the best move for a narrative is to take the narrative as a whole, if possible, not like a verse-by-verse -verse process, because again, the point of it is sometimes not revealed in any one specific verse, or at least not until the closing pieces of dialogue sometimes. Um, and then we step back, and we want to know, in this context, what do we learn about God, and what do we learn about his expectations for Israel? This is what we want to be asking ourselves. We want to look at those clues that we were talking about. How the law provides a moral backup. Is the, what does the law like, help us to understand about this? Uh, look for clues for God's point of view. Things the narrator will say that brings God's perspective into it. That's very important in understanding the point of it. Take note of the first point of dialogue in a scene. That's that critical summary dialogue. Uh, or a critical turning point in dialogue between the main characters in the scene. And then note any repetition, that where it's like beating it over our heads. Defy the armies of the living God. Defies the armies of the living God. When you've not defied people, but the, ar but the God who stands behind his armies, etc., etc. When you read that, then you're, okay, I'm getting the point here. Then we step back, and we're going to end up with a principle that makes sense for Israel that makes sense for the people that this was originally written for. That's where we're going next. What is God trying to like, help these stubborn people understand? And that's what we want to come up with first. That's step one. It can't, and this is a, a key interpretational principle I put here in your, in your outline. It can't mean something different to you than it meant for them at this stage. You have to think. It can't be, you know... Uh, 
So, uh, some idea that wouldn't make sense to them in light of God, what the Spirit was saying to them at that time. Come up with a principle. Do your best to look at these clues and come up with a principle and understand, wow, God's really trying to get them to understand something about Himself, something about His purpose with them, and, and something about individual people like David who step up in faith and align themselves with God's purpose and power. If you do that, you have victory. Maybe that's, a, maybe that's God telling us to do that. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if that has to be closed for this to say, maybe that's my problem. That didn't even occur to me. Mm, that's it. It's never going to sink if it's open, probably, right? Ah. Hmm. Put it elsewhere, and then maybe we can actually get it, so I can show you what I was thinking. Okay. Now, this is going to conflict. All right. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay, now we're moving over to the New Covenant. Now we're moving over to the New Covenant. We're taking that principle... Maybe this is a war narrative. Maybe this is about David and his armies routing, you know, the Moabites or Joshua, you know, <laughs> conquering part of the land to seize it or whatever. Then we're going to get to the purpose behind it. How, how is that purpose that once we understand what's God's purpose? God's purpose is that they realize his promise, which is which is intended to preserve his holy people across the salvation history, and to honor all his commitments to them. Once we get to that, then we look at this through the lens of the new covenant. And I say God's plan in salvation history hasn't changed, but it has reached a new phase. The goal isn't the preservation of a nation, but the spread of the gospel. It's about not saving a nation, it's about expanding the people of God across the planet, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for that purpose. That's what he's doing now in our phase of this plan. The, the, the promise is going to be realized uh, to the nations of the world. How do the principles derived from the narrative fit a people of God drawn from all nations and guided by the Holy Spirit? When you look at it in that context, now you're going to formulate an applicational principle that would be the same idea, but in light of a new lens, is the way I will explain it to you. It still should make sense it, it still shouldn't be something that's so far out of whack that Gideon, if he knew a little bit about our culture, should be able to understand that point also. If he understood about the New Covenant, it should make sense to him. It should be something that can function for the church in all the different nations of the world. Some general principle that makes sense, but of life today in light of the New Covenant. So this is where we walk away from the specifics of his dealing with Israel into the specifics of the church, the Great Commission, and uh, the uh, Pentecost, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit onto the people of God. No more law. Now uh, we, we are led by the Spirit of God. Once you understand that, now you're going to understand some things have still not changed. And so you're gonna, you should end up with an applicational principle, general principle that makes perfect sense of life today drawn from that. And if it's based on God and His purposes in our lives, then it's going, you, you can imagine it's not normally going to be very different. It's not normally going to be very different once we get over to that point. Okay. So now I'm going to, we're going to look at an example. 2 Samuel 11 and 12. I'm going to show you two passages from the Bathsheba narrative uh, to illustrate a point that Hopefully I will get that PowerPoint uh, by the next slide, and then we'll look at it. Uh, because I've color-coded things to help you see those clues. Uh, but I didn't do it in this version, so, yeah. Okay, so, here's the story. So, uh, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. 
They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. The, her name Bathsheba has nothing to do with the fact she was in the bath. Okay, you, know that. <laughs> you probably knew that. See, a good study Bible will tell you that. Bath means that she's the daughter of Sheba. That's what Bathsheba means. She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. That's her dad, probably. Sheba's her mom. And the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Okay? So then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Okay? Now, no moral commentary exists in this opening section. Because the author and the Spirit of God assume that you know this is not okay. So it doesn't have to say anything. The, the framework of the law helps us to, to start cringing as we're watching this and thinking, what a dummy. What, what a dummy. What a foolish man. You know, that he's, so you can see it all coming. And then see, we're, but we don't have to worry because we're going to get to the point and the first point of dialogue. And we're going to see all of this, how, uh, uh, what a horrible mistake um, that uh, David has made here. But that's the point. We don't, we don't see that. Now, we've, I've left out the next part of the story, which is David sends this woman's husband out to battle to be killed because when he comes back to Jerusalem, he doesn't stay with his wife. So there's no way for David to hide the fact that he's the father because this man is not uh, staying with his wife. He's been gone a long time in the field of battle, and he comes back briefly. David cannot get the guy drunk, tries to convince him. To go be with his wife, he doesn't do it, he goes back into the field. David has no choice from his perspective. His sin is about to be revealed, and so instead he has the man killed by being pushed to the front of the battle, and he's killed. And word comes back to David that he is dead. Okay, now. Nathan appears. Now, I didn't put Nathan's story into this either, because Nathan's story is a different genre. Nathan tells David what is essentially a parable of a man who takes, a, a rich man who takes a poor man's lamb, the, the one that the man loves, and it's all he has, and that he does that, uh, and, uh, and then he tells him this parable, and then this is the end, we shift back into the narrative. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, Nathan's the prophet sent by God to talk to David, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Wow. Wow. So that's the same way parables work in the New Testament. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you, came over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little... I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Repetition. Despise the word of God. He's going to come back again. With the sword. And again, the sword. Again, repetition. And you took his wife to be your own. Okay? You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. That's against the law. Murder's against the law. You think that you did it indirectly. God's saying, no, you killed him using the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Okay, when you get to this, you're getting multiple things. Here you're getting God's point of view. It's coming directly through the mouth of the prophet Nathan. This is the whole point of everything in this narrative. The rest, if you stop before you get to this point, this narrative is very confusing. Now it becomes crystal clear. God's point of view is revealed. And this is what is so upsetting to God of this, that he would, uh, he would do uh, something this evil after God did, gave him everything he could have possibly ever wanted. He went outside the bounds of God's law and despised. He doesn't just despise God's word. He despises God, he says, right? That's a strong word here to do this. So that repetition, when you see a repetition like that, you're underlining. You're seeing it again. You underline it when you're going through the text. That is the main point. 
Now, there are a lot of different applicational points that you can get from this narrative, but like, let's say you just want to focus on this one. Despise the word of the Lord. Despising God's word uh, you know, by behaving in this kind of way. We go take, okay, so here are some observations. Okay, I, yeah. David desires and has sexual relations. The law forbids that. He deliberately causes Uriah to be killed. God clarifies David killed him. Uh, that doesn't excuse his sin. It's still murder. Nathan delivers God's perspective. God tells him twice that he has despised the Lord through his actions. Sins against others while breaking God's law are the same as despising the Lord. Sins under the law have consequences. Okay, so... Get to the final point. Now, this is one applicational point. I'm just stepping through, just throwing this out. Okay? There could be many different points from this text. As you are studying this, the Lord may speak to you in a, in a different way as some principle, but if you've isolated the various principles, hiding sin, breaking God's laws, uh, thinking I had somebody else do my dirty work, all of these principles might, might be something that God might use to talk to us because God feels the same about sin, right? So we go from the narrative here, the principle, if God's people break his laws by sinning against one another, it is the same as despising the Lord who gave them. Yeah, when you hurt other people, you, it, you are despising God and his word. That's the part of the message. It's not between you and somebody else. It's, it's between you and God. That's, that's the principle. Now, we have harsh condemnation for adultery under the Old Covenant. It's death, actually, in Leviticus 20. Under the New Covenant, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1 to 2. Praise God. But don't grieve the Spirit of God. Don't use your freedom to indulge uh, your, your sin. And Ephesians 4.30. We, we have responsibility. The Spirit dwells in us. We don't grieve the Spirit of God, but we don't have condemnation. So what is the principle? Okay. It's, it's flipped. It's about despising the Lord or loving God. If we love God, we should do what He says. Love is the fulfillment of the law. The, under the new covenant, yeah, it's not despising God, it's loving Jesus. So when, if we love God, we do what He commands us. That's Jesus' message. That's the message of hope for those who are not condemned, is we show our love to God by keeping His commands and loving one another. Love is the fulfillment of the law, Paul says in Romans 13, 8. So we, we show our love for God by loving other people. It's sort of the flip side of this thing. We despise God when we despise one another. And we can think of that, um, that uh, parable in Matthew where Jesus says, you know, the, where, he, where he's the, the, the goats and the sheep where he's separating people, and he says those who loved, the ones who are going into eternity are those who loved the least of these brethren who loved me also, right? And those who didn't go the other direction. So the principle still stands. Uh, the way we treat other people is a direct reflection on our uh, relationship with God. Yeah. And so then maybe you're going through this and maybe you're preparing a talk or maybe you're just, the Lord's convicting you over being a real jerk to your spouse at that moment. And you're thinking, you know, uh, I should honor my spouse even when they really bug me. Maybe that's all that it, God's got in this for you at the moment that you're reading it. But maybe there are bigger applications at different point in your life. Or maybe you're speaking to your group and you're challenging people, you know, to, um, to, to, to uh, resolve broken relationships in their life and, uh, and to treat people with gentleness in your life. Maybe that's something that God's talk speaking to you about. And that's the way, Lord, I, I don't get too many chances to show you how much I love you and, and how, how I can honor you, Lord. So I'm going to do that through the people you put in my life. Maybe that's how the, the principle that comes back to you under the New Covenant, right? But we get there this way. We don't get there directly from the Bathsheba incident, the fact that somebody's in a bath. Doesn't matter. That's not the point. Um, the, certainly the point of adultery could be the point. If, if it's, but but it, it, there is a bigger point here even than adultery. Though that is a horrible sin under the law. Murder and adultery are the two big sins under the law. And you've got both of them in this narrative by a guy who supposedly ha is a man after God's own heart. So there's a very strong lesson in that, uh, in that process. And he does pay the price for that, right? So he doesn't get off the hook. So it's very serious to God that comes through through the principle. All right?
Okay, now let me see if I can get that other one. I did. All right. Okay. Let's start again from the beginning. <laughs> Just quick, I'm going to step you through some of the ones we missed. Okay, so here's that picture. David defeating Goliath in the valley of the Allah. And here, God gives Palestine to the descendants of Abraham as part of his covenant promise. See, in other words, God's in control. God's got a plan. Therefore, that's how we look and understand that narrative. In the context, you go from this key verse here. This is the first point of dialogue I was talking about. All those gathered here will know it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. That's the key bit of dialogue when he says that uh, to Goliath. And that principle of the Lord, the battle is the Lord's, is that is also the story of the Old Testament as a whole. The battle is the Lord's. And that's the story of God across eternity. We're going to get all the way to the book of Revelation. The battle is the Lord's people in the end. Uh, you can put Revelation 21 to 22 up there. Okay? So that's how you understand it. If it doesn't make sense in this context, then we're not looking at it right. You get these key points and then step back and think, what's the big picture for Israel? And now, what's the big picture for God's people in all times? And then we get to that. Okay. So here we're okay. So here, part of the story that directly relate to commands in the law. This is from our narrative we just looked at, and Deuteronomy five eighteen. You shall not commit adultery. It's assumed. Here's that passage from Genesis thirty nine. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian ma master. Look for these insights where the narrator is giving you an insight that's a spiritual insight beyond the simple viewpoint of the narrative itself. Anybody could have been there and, see, and could see Joseph doing great in Potiphar's house. Okay? But what, we know, what we've now just been given is a glimpse into what's behind that, which is the Lord and his power in the life of this man. Very important. Clue to us. First point of dialogue. Here, this is, this is the end of the narrative. And this is the, when Joseph finally got his brothers... Remember his initial dream that like that the wheat would be bowing down to him, and they're like beating him up and laughing at him. Here we are at the end. <clears throat> Here we are at the end. Joseph said to his brothers, "Come close to me. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you." For two years now there's been a famine, and for the next five years there will be no plowing or reaping. God sent me ahead of you to prepare for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. In other words, see how this connects to the big picture? All of a sudden you realize everything about Joseph is about this idea of God saving his people. And God acted powerfully to put this man into a position to do that. This is that critical point of dialogue, and it's right at the end of the narrative that makes sense of everything that happens. God was always powerful and in control. God will always preserve his people, even down to us and to today. As horrible as things look in this world, right? And repetition here, like I mentioned, defy the armies of the living God. Defy the armies of the living God. I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This is the point. When you come against God, give God's people, you come against God. That's the point we need to know. Okay. Thanks for that. And, and here was that passage with all my color coding. Look at that. All right. Okay. Now, last uh, concluding point here, and then uh, if we have any questions, I'll take questions. We're doing on time. Okay, we're almost out of time. Perfect. Therefore, this is Hebrews 12. This is the wrap-up after Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 sums up all these great figures from the Old Testament historical narrative. Gives us little summary bits of their faithfulness. And then he says this in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the witnesses, the word in Greek for witnesses, is not, when we think of witness, we think of somebody who sees something, but a witness, and the way they use it, is somebody who has a testimony. So it's what the witness brings into court. That's, so it's somebody that has a testimony. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of 
people who bear testimonies through their faithfulness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So this is the idea. These people in the Old Testament have a testimony. And not all of them did it all right. We just saw David there do as horribly as you could imagine. Um, but it's meant for our encouragement that we would be the same, only under the new covenant. Run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, warning and shame, and sat down in the way of the throne. That's why we have these narratives, people. Okay, any questions? Yes? If David was living in the New Testament and was doing the same thing, the sin, God was punishing him the same way? No, he wouldn't punish him. Yeah, if he did. But then I'm not sure he would have done it because he would have had, he had the Holy Spirit on him but not dwelling in him the way believers do. So maybe he would have been a different guy. I don't know. God had his purposes in having him in that moment. We have a lot of help in this time frame because of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Yeah, I just I think about what a horrible, horrible person I'd be if it weren't for the Spirit. Like probably other people feel the same way. I just God has really changed me over my life. So so I don't know. It's hard to say David was operating under a different framework, and it was a framework of law. And uh, who knows? I mean, there's no excuse for what he did in any covenant, right? But still, I think he, it would have been different. He certainly, there's no condemnation now. Yeah, we're not, un, uh, for, uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death, which is the Old Testament law. So, so we have uh, different expectations, but we also have different help as we live out God's uh, holiness. Yes. The thing that struck me about David was that right from the beginning, he was disobedient. He should have gone to war. Oh, I, there are a number of things that, times where you're reading his story and you're scratching your head. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I actually just finished a devotional uh, book called uh, The Making of a Man of God by uh, Alan Redpath. I've, I've read it different times in my life. I just read it and... Uh, David really did a lot of things that are kind of hard to wrap your head around. Yeah. But then God, he loved God. He really loved God. So it always brought him back. That's Yes. Any questions? Any more questions about Old Testament era? So as we're reading it, this is the process. Look for the clues. Take a step back. Think of the covenant. Come up with that general point, which is all wrapped around God's purposes, and then cross over to our time in your life, and don't just jump across, otherwise you're going to be putting out, you know, pieces of bread or milk or whatever, and missing the point, right? I wish it worked out, it doesn't work. Yes. Yes. It seems like, even with the Old Testament saints, you have that thing the Lord said, he who draws near to me, I will draw near to him. And then David also says, don't take your spirit from me. Right. So there seems to be that those who want to honor the Lord draw near to him, and the Lord is near to them. Yes. Walking with them. Yes. Even when he set up the tabernacle yes. Yes. the tents, he was in the center. Yes. He was with his people. Yes. This is his desire to be with his people as a household. Yes. I, I, I completely agree with you. This is also going to take us, this is going to be interesting, we're going to get to, when we get to Psalms, which is, is that next week? Are we in Psalms week. next week? Um, but we'll look, at, we'll look at the psalm that he wrote after the Bathsheba incident. Uh, that, I think that's going to be kind of interesting for us to look at that having covered this. So. What was the name of the book you read about? Uh, Alan Redpath, it's called The Making of a Man of God. And it studies in the life of David. It's a it's a really cool book. He does some he he allegorizes some of the stories, makes some of the things about David uh, like types of Jesus. You know, he does a lot of that, which is what we're what I'm trying to encourage you not to do that. But uh, it's a blessed book. It really is. It's it, I've read I've gone through it a couple different times in my life, and it's uh, God's really spoken to me from it. But, uh, but partly because, you know, I make mistakes like David. Not that mistake, but <laughs> not that one, uh, by, by the grace of God, but uh, others. So. 
Yes. And what are the, is there any way, is this, are these PowerPoint files you have? Yes. Is there any way yeah. we can get access yeah, yeah. to Yeah, That's a great idea. What I'll do is I'll output these as uh, PDF so that yeah. you can have them. Yeah, we'll put them on the website. We're going to be putting these videos also on the website yeah. and, and, and the handouts. Read, and I can put the PowerPoints up there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, and you can also email me uh, here uh, at Hoodridge. Yeah, but if it's put out on the website, then... Yeah, I'll put it up on the website. I'll put it up on the website for you. Yeah. All right, let me close. Uh, Jesus, thank you for our time today. Uh, Lord, we want to be people after your heart. And you use uh, the, the victories and also the failures of these people in the Old Testament to speak your wisdom to us. I pray that we would be listeners, Lord Jesus, and that we would glorify you as we uh, become part of your story in, in serving you and trusting you, Lord Jesus. Thanks for our time today in your name. Amen. Amen.